I now invite the head of the Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, University of Kerala, Professor Atsu Shankar S. Nair, to deliver the keynote address on machine learning and its effect on humans. Sir, please. Most welcome, Professor. So, my namaskaram to all the participants of this meeting. I come from the background of computers and computer science. And I'm naturally enthused by the theme of this meet. Uh, how in the digitalized world, how humanity can be protected. Uh, I speak only on one aspect of the issue. I would like to talk about what machine learning is already doing and is promising to do. And how it would impact our lives in a very deep way. I am a person, I am a teacher, a very passionate teacher, and I am led by uh, the person who has influenced me most, uh, is my Manasa Guru, you know, I have not been a student, but he leads me, and his name is uh, Jerome Bruner, uh, an educational psychologist, and what he said was, one of the things he said that influences me, is that anything can be taught to anyone. Anything can be taught to anyone. What a profound thought. It leads me like a lighthouse. It leads me. Now, why I say this at this point is computers are now saying, or machine learning is now saying, anything can be learned by computers. Anything can be learned. And all that the computer asks is give enough data and we will learn what that data represents. So today we have face recognition cameras. We have emotion detection cameras, a camera that can look into your face and say whether you are happy or not, or whether you're angry, whether you're agitated, whether you are depressed. At one end. And at the other end, we have cars which have learned to drive without the human driver. I think we are all aware of it. Driverless cars. We have many more things which we are not, which has not come to a friend. For example, there is a software by the name GPT-3 and GPT-4. What do these softwares promises? Well, it promises something very, very tall. It says, I can do anything with language. What is the proof? I would like to tell you some interesting proofs. One, a media person from the Guardian newspaper asked, could you write an article for the Guardian edit page on the subject, will computers rule human beings? And the program readily, in a flash of a second, it wrote an article. The article went to the edit desk of Guardian and the editor made some changes which they would make with a human written article also. They made some edits and the article was carried, it was published last year in the edit page. The article talks about whether computers would rule human being, but the very fact that the article was written by a computer, it indirectly answers the question, you know, that the computer is moving into, you know, at least playing the roles that a human being would play, which would include ruling other human beings. This program is able to do anything with language, like, for example, ask it to translate, to translate, ask it to write an essay, it will write. As a teacher, I'm very scared. Maybe soon the students would go to the GPT-3 and say, please write an essay on Gandhi and modern science. And the essay is delivered. And the teacher would find it very difficult to find out whether the student wrote because it cannot be caught by plagiarism softwares because it is originally written by the software. Why assignments? Maybe even the dissertations, the PhD dissertation itself would be written by GPT-3 just like a very expert human being would do. And look at some other fields, like for example, there's a software called DAL-E. You give it a theme and it makes a sketch of it. Many of you may have actually tried it out. And uh, there are many, many other examples I could go on to list. Uh, but there are some which are not very visible to us. For example, we all know that chess is a very complex game, a game of brain. 
and the computers have been at it it has played and won against world champions but now the the forum has changed from chess to a chinese game called go because it is said that the chinese game is 10000 times more complex than chess and today uh computer computer systems have come out one called alpha go this game is called go and this program actually can defeat the world go champion and from the field of science especially in the context of corona and all going on sorry uh i would like to tell you that one of these long standing problems of science has been solved by machine learning the problem of protein folding proteins are made up of amino acid chains and how they fold into what shape is of great interest to scientists even in the, in, in the case of corona also this question was a very important question for scientists and uh, machine learning softwares have actually given a near perfect solution for that i even suspect that in another 2 3 years instead of the creator of this program this program itself might be considered for a nobel prize and i wouldn't be surprised with that uh now this being the case it is very evident that machine learning systems are going to deliver a lot of service to humanity but technology is always a double edged sword and we may have lot of new unprecedented issues that come up in the society i will cite an example that these programs most of these programs can read human emotions now initially it might look like a scientific achievement and a very curious thing but as we stare more closely at this development it will scare you for example if the computer can find out who is uh, what is in your mind in a, a dictator might use it to find out who is actually thinking against the government now we are there only talking about dictators are talking about how people are acting or people are speaking against the government but no government is able to find out what people are thinking because i think the human mind is a republic a republic which only the the owner of that mind uh, has an entry into you, maybe you can indirectly read mind of people but mind is a place where a person has free will the whole freedom but when a machine learning system can enter it and find out indirectly what the person thinks in hand of a dictator that would be a terrible weapon you know you see in for example in north korea you see some videos where when the president dictator president makes a emotional statement people are forced to cry they better cry because they will have great difficulty you must have also heard that in this country that uh, laughter was uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, not permitted for a few days due to the president's wish now in such a place if the learning system would read the mind that would be a very terrible thing in the hand of a dictatorial government uh, i am told in china there are cameras put in the classroom i traveled in china i know china well uh, put in the classroom which would read the my uh, read the face of the students look at the face of the students and say whether they are listening or not whether they seriously listening or not now this could go to many extents for example the one of the ministers one of the ministers calls a meeting of officers and a program tells the minister that out of the 10 people the two guys sitting on the right they are full of protest towards you they don't like you but they are just feigning that uh, they are very respectful to you if such a message is given to a authority or a person in power what could what could be the repercussions of that i think most of us can imagine so uh, the biggest threat of humanity is the technology being used in very wrong directions and which would uh, kind of uh, reduce the free will of human beings and their the, the only their solace of freedom you know whatever country 
whatever political system are there human beings still enjoy uh, the freedom in their republic of their mind now technology is going to make even that difficult so that is the challenge that the digital world is throwing up and uh, of course also this question of existential questions of what would happen if everything is done by machines you know robots are there they will do your uh, you work they will carry you Uh, they will read books of books for you actually you don't need to read books they will read books understand and summarize it for you uh, you know all kinds of things household work is done by it and you know what would human beings be doing what would be left for human beings to be doing and what would uh, it mean to exist as a human being these questions stare at us they will soon take very solid form and uh, will be in front of us this is what i feel about the technology world i by no means want to paint a picture of uh, a dismal picture a picture of uh, negativity but uh, this is only a part of my scientific bent of mind where technology needs to be analyzed in a very balanced manner by looking both at its positive service aspects as well as its uh, you know its issues i will make one suggestion uh, because i was told that we must uh, go on to act uh i think that uh it is time for us to talk of a law a law to regulate the use of artificial intelligence perhaps we are a bit early but we need to start talking about it uh to ensure that the newer forms of uh, compromising human dignity and human freedom by this technology which is hitherto unknown needs to be studied needs to be addressed and needs to be regulated by a suitable law i think i'll stop here i will be happy to take questions or listen to comments thank you very much you much it was really uh very interesting because uh, now that means the machines are more intelligent than us in a way and at the same time what you are suggesting regarding the law that says that something needs to be done the consciousness needs to be developed and the human will must have its own way please roini thank you sir so we have a response by the minister for education dr v ragu former dean rajiv gandhi national institute for youth development well respected swami ji my brothers and sisters from different countries professor achil shankar and friends it was really informative interesting to listen to dr achil shankar his scientific temper and the way of presentation of course machine learning is an issue to be discussed in detail at the end of the talk he has mentioned about certain rules and regulations laws to be you know thought about what is to be done because we are moving to a dangerous zone at the same time i would like to recall something like regulatory skills of the participants we need to train or orient the participants about the concept called regulatory skills how do you regulate your own behavior your own expression your own thoughts because we need to learn that we live in such a world where uh, you know machines are able to identify analyze our emotions and feelings of course there are pros and cons and he has highlighted uh, the basic issues especially in teaching and learning he was quoting some examples from china uh, the typical political system or neighbor what they are doing and how it is going to impact influence the field of education the teaching learning process this is something very important uh, when we talk about you know higher especially higher education how machines can be meaningfully utilized how uh, the rules and regulations are to be modified how the regulatory skills are to be you know thought about because uh, 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 we are waiting for that scenario which is going to happen 
I appreciate Dr. Achyut Shankar for his meaningful, thought-provoking ideas and sharing of thoughts. Thank you very much for my patient listening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Raghu. Yes, anybody else wants to react to this? Or shall we go to the next person? Honorable Speaker, sir, Mr. Dirk Sailing would like to respond. Yes, most welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and also Professor Ahu. Um, I think it was a very important speech uh, you have done, and um, I would like, uh, it would be fantastic if it is possible um, if Professor Ahmed Shankar motion to introduce a law to regulate artificial intelligence and protect human dignity and freedom. Is this possible? Yes, Professor Ahmed Shankar, would you like to react? Yeah. I think that uh, many countries are moving towards a law to regulate artificial intelligence and its use. It is possible to do that because uh, a large uh, part of usage of artificial intelligence would be in the public domain. You know, the governments themselves would be using this. So a regulatory system would set some limits for it and there will be some public audit and the public would be able to react to unfair use if there is a there is a law which regulates uh, regulates it uh, it is very possible and uh, uh, discussions have to start at different levels so that such a law can be proposed and can be suggested to the lawmakers that is the role that communities can do thank you thank you honorable speaker uh, mr christoph dumas has raised his hand i think he would like to Add on something. Yes, Christoph, bienvenue, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, uh, thank you for Professor Shankar, uh, Shankar because it was a really uh, great talk, and I fully support uh, your motion. And actually, yesterday um, I talked about the, the issue uh, we can raise uh, with uh, this kind of machine learning during my science and technology uh, question. And uh, I proposed uh, to have actually one global uh, committee uh, for ethics. And because actually we should not have a national law because uh, we should have a global law. And if we, if we want it to, 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 to make it um, properly. And I think, yes, it is important issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Achit. Thank, Thank you, sir. Honorable speaker, sir, with your permission, we shall now move on to the next submissions and responses. Yes. So first we have on the topic, water and natural resources. So the submission is by the Minister for Water and Natural Resources, Mr. Nicholas Beru, expert on climate and ecology, France. Yes. Bienvenue, Professor. Most welcome. Respected uh, Swamiji, uh, honorable members of the parliament, honorable ministers, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today at um, uh, Global Energy Parliament. Recently, a close parent happened to be in an emergency situation and had to be transported on long distance to reach a hospital. This person has been mistreated in this circumstance. Why? What happened? The medical operators in charge of this transfer applied procedures. They obeyed to orders from their remote administration and they did not really care about this person, this human being as such. These agents seem to have lost part of their own humanity and of their capacity to interact with another human and fully respect this other human. These agents prove their 100% submission to a tool. They have forgotten their ultimate mission, which is to take care of a human. They have failed. Why am I telling this story in the present session of the GEP? We have a common close parent which is in an, in an emergency and needs care 
it is the Earth with its resources, with the numerous and diverse beings that it hosts. The digital, digital, digitalization of our society brings many tools which can help science and help to share a common understanding of the state of the Earth. But if humans in charge of the knowledge or the management of natural resources concentrate too much about tools and particularly the infinite combination of numerical tools, these human operators can be hypnotized and captured by their tools. They can become separated from their core mission. They can lose a large part of their subtle capacities to interact with Earth. They can fail. Nowadays, the state of the Earth, the state of the so-called environment and natural resources is widely known among almost all compartments of the society, general public, governments, corporations, academia. It is well known that human activities have in many areas exceeded the planet, planetary limits. They have exceeded the level of resources consumption, which the Earth would have been able to regenerate. If the world society maintains the present conditions where the prevailing type of economy is linear, predatory, and intensively burning or degrading the natural resources, there will be no future for our children and for humanity. What is the root cause of the present failure? According to wise persons from indigenous peoples, according to many traditions and religions, and according to a growing number of scientists, the root cause is the false notion that humans are separated from other forms of life and from the earth. We are all one and the various forms of life are interdependent. If humanity wants to survive, it has to find a new regime of interactions with the so-called natural resources, with the biosphere. If the economy is understood as the organization of interactions between so sociosphere, biosphere and technosphere, we have to shift to an economy fully compatible with the respect of all forms of life, an economy which does not take resources beyond the regeneration capacity of the earth. We have to reach a forever economy. These are the words heard from an Australian Aborigines elder forever economy. This is feasible. We can recover symbiosis with nature. We can recover harmony, but only if a large portion of humans rediscover this simple truth, we are all one with Earth. Now, the question in relation to the present session is, does the digitalization of our society today help us in this evolution or not? So we'll concentrate about knowledge in this talk. And uh, knowledge of nature, knowledge of natural resources can be reached through several ways. The first I'd like to mention is our body's experience. Being incarnated on planet Earth, it is our privilege for the time of a life to encounter and experience many aspects of nature. The physical experience, what our body experiences in presence and in contact with nature teaches us a lot, probably more than we can imagine and describe. Our contact with the earth, with breath, the water, or our sensations in the presence of the various natural rains touches us through a large number of senses, through many kinds of vibrations. Modern te technological sensors are able to make measurements within limited ranges, and they report only about a part of the reality. A physical device cannot be equivalent to a biological component. Most probably, the biological parts of our body are in remote interactions with biological or physical components of the other living beings or inner beings which we are exposed to, through means that the contemporary science does not yet embrace. The totality of our body's experience cannot be described by a set of technical sensors, by a scientific report. It cannot be described by a set of numbers or digital representations. Any attempt of such a description is only a reduction our body's experience is not replaceable by a digitalized process. In the area of this physical experience, the digitalization has no major role to play. Just uh, something to mention, 
when the physical experience is impossible to many, virtual reality devices can be valuable. For example, only a few humans have the opportunity to dive deep under the ocean surface. Virtual reality makes a part of this experience accessible to others. Inversely, the digitalization of our society carries the risk of mobilizing too much human attention and of consuming too much of the rare and precious time of a human life. Long before the digital era, era Alexandre Dumas, a French writer, said, Les enfants devraient vivre au grand air, face à face avec la nature, qui fortifie le corps, qui poétise l'âme et éveille en elle une curiosité plus précieuse pour l'éducation que toutes les grammaires du monde. Which means, in short, facing nature is more essential in education than any grammar. Similarly, facing nature is more essential than sitting in front of any digital screen. The recent global health crisis and its lockdowns have worsened the situation of the children and the youth in this respect. In 2020, 2022, the population of several countries has become more dependent on digital communications and tools. They have been locked and deprived of irreplaceable physical encounters and experience. From this point of view, among others, these measures were abusive and damageable. Another way to um, get to knowledge about natural resources is a spiritual way. The spiritual experience of nature for example, the consciousness of our unity with nature is extremely powerful. Can digitalized tools help? Question. Thousands of years of traditions and great civilizations have showed us that the spiritual encounter with the nature is, we belong to does not need digitalization. Can some, form, some forms of art benefit from the digitalization of our society? Perhaps. I see that the time is running and I have to be a bit shorter. Uh, it's, 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 it is true that the universal distribution of some pictures and of some pieces of arts help humans to realize that they are part of a world village and that they are aboard a unique and single spaceship. But books and literature have been and are still able to achieve the same with more modest resources and technologies. Then comes the mental knowledge. And of course, in science, um, the digitalization um, has brought a lot uh, in, the, in the last century and now. So within the framework of this contemporary science, the digital tools are indispensable and they have led to many achievements. And I, I don't think uh, I need to, to develop this at all. Of course, there are many drawbacks to the digitalization, uh, which are which have been mentioned by, by previous leaders, and I, I, I don't come back on this. I would like to mention that indigenous peoples, among others, uh, have um, other ways to transmit knowledge that are much more holistic. And they include both, yes, physical, uh, mental and spiritual connections. We have also the possibility of direct communication with animals and plants, and I cannot develop this now. The, to conclude, I would like to uh, insist on just one fact. The education is a key. Uh, we have to, uh, we must tell our children to know the world through their body and through the full spectrum of their senses so that their potentials can emerge. We must allow our children to explore the human capacity and to meet the other range. If we allow our children to reach true knowledge and the full knowledge, then the decision-making will be also wise and, and adapted. And I think the future of our humanity and our evolution is very much dependent on this. We have to uh, give to our children an education in contact with nature. Thank you very much. Uh, with you, it was really very interesting. A lot of information. The digital world has limits. That's what you suggested to us. And at the same time, the spiritual knowledge or the physical contact 
uh, of the human being, which is evolving. Uh, in fact, we need to give you an hour to have a little more of your knowledge. But that is somebody who has uh, lifted their hand. So let us continue with the questions, please. Rohini, you can give the floor to... Uh, Honorable okay. Speaker, sir. First, yes. we'll have the response by the Minister for Environment, Lady Carla Davis. Oh, yes, yes. It's very true. Uh, namaste, Lady Carla. Namaste, His Holiness, Jagat Guru, Swami Isa, and Dr. Vyas, His Excellency, Dr. C.B. Ananda Bose, Professor Nair, Nicholas Biro, Honorable and Honorable uh, Dignitaries and Ministers, and my GEP family, Rohini, Mira, and all other guests in attendance. I want to say that just because the media says something is going to take over uh, humanity, that doesn't mean that it's a given or that people have to accept it. As I mentioned yesterday, the issue is how technology is utilized and who controls us. And I have to uh, say I give good support to Dr. Dirk Seelin and Dr. Dumas, who have suggested, you know, uh, that there be uh, controls on these things. And whatever law or draft is uh, put up, both freedom and privacy need to be specifically addressed. Uh, now, I also applaud you, Nicholas, on your enlightening presentation. How you compared everything and identified the root cause uh, were excellent. And there is one area I suggest a shuffle of a few words be made, and they are shown in the first and sixth paragraph on, uh, I believe it's page two of your report, um, where you mentioned that operators can be hypnotized and captured by their tools. I think it'd be good to add, and who controls them? Uh, because that, as I say, is a very big issue. And then going down further, it is a well-known that the mismanagement of human activities, I think would be a good uh, suggestion how to word that. And in many areas disrupted the planetary no. ecosystems. And the reason why I make these suggestions is so that we avoid the uh, dispute that goes on between one side of the fence and the other. And this way we keep the focus on the issue rather than the people fighting about who's right and who's wrong. So I would like to suggest that you consider that. But I really appreciate it and love the way you uh, made all these uh, comparisons. That was really good. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Minister, and then we pass the floor to the next person, Rohini. Honorable sir, next we have the response by honorable member, Dr. Guido D. Korer. Bonjour. Good day. I Good have day. a question in the, in the following. I agree with you that we all belong to the same biosphere. And it is good that more people would be aware of that. But at the same time, I wonder if we can still do something, what you suggested, I guess, that is in, two, uh, in 1950, we were two and a half billion persons. And now we are eight billion persons. And we all want to have the same comfort, the same things, whether we dialogize uh, with digits <clears throat> or not. Uh, how can we do that? We, we were now living in an Anthropocene so far. And now the suggestion is coming that we are going to uh, symbiocene because we are so many and we all want the same comfort and the same things. How can there be enough natural resources to sustain that? Yes. Uh, Nicola Berrios, if you want to react to it. Uh, I would like to make a point on yes. that issue. And that is a very good point that you brought up. Uh, what uh, my late husband and I had uh, talked about in this issue is that when you lift the standard of living of people, the population naturally starts to decline. And uh, this is one area that has not been addressed. And people seem to ignore the fact that when you lift the standard of living of many people, you don't, the population automatically starts to take care of itself. 
So I think that's something that we could start to consider is that like they did in Singapore, where the prime minister lifted everybody in the country and people started planning their lives more and were more productive and didn't have as or need as big of families. One of the reasons why people needed bigger families in the earlier days is to help do the, the farming and the different chores and so on. So it got to be a cultural thing where their families grew. And I think, uh, you know, family planning and, and realistic is, is a good thing. Education, it's all to do with education. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, if we take the population that we have today, let's say seven billions, and the question is, can we, can we satisfy the needs uh, for uh, proper human life for seven billion persons? Um, to, 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 to speak short, I, I would say, I think so. Uh, and uh, we have to free ourselves from, 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 from some wrong ways. Uh, well, one of the wrong ways is, one of the, the wrong ways is, is, is a growth, uh, a bad uh, notion of the growth with the GDP growth, for example. And um, the financial and monetary system we are, uh, prisoner of, and uh, the present uh, financial system pushes uh, everyone in, in, to do more, more and more fast, etc. And so it's pushing us into a certain direction of growth. I cannot develop, but this is wrong and this can, can be changed. And a second uh, part of the answer regarding the kind of economy we have to reinvent um, there is, a, you, you mentioned the symbiocene, thank you, um, Guido Découvreur, you mentioned the symbiocene as an idea uh, after the Anthropocene. And I would like just to refer to the uh, theory of the uh, economy symbiotique uh, developed by uh, an, uh, an author named Isabelle Delanois, where uh, a new kind of economy is described and uh, where um, uh, so I cannot develop now, but um, thank you for, for your question, and I hope later we can we can develop more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So may I now invite the next.